Good evening from Beijing. I'm Kate Kui. Welcome to this special edition of China-U.S. Economist Talk or Econ Talk. Before we start, two years ago, when the trade war between China and the U.S. was heating up, Professor Justin Yifulin and Neil Ferguson had a public debate on Chinese economy and its growth momentum. At that time, Neil Ferguson asserted that Chinese economy will not be able to keep its growth momentum, while Justin Lin was willing to bet against it that China will not only be able to keep its growth speed, but also become a global economic leader. Well, years later, the COVID-19 pandemic happened. What was argued or disagreed upon were temporarily shelved, and the world was let down a route of self-redemption. People are keeping their physical distance, and this globalized society suddenly dissolved into different pieces. Something even the most draconian sanctions or trade policies could not do. With the world finally recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, now we find ourselves in a totally different world. Globalization is supposed to bring equality, but after the pandemic, we see inequality exacerbated in certain countries. While、well, we look for more technology innovations to help us adapt to a more remote work-life environment, we are also concerned excessive automation will eventually bring redundancy instead of job creation and wage increase in long-term development. Having too large of a tech monopoly might also negatively impact innovation itself and hurt consumer benefits. We're also facing climate change and a renewed Cold War mentality. How can we make technology for good, and how can we achieve sustainable development on the on national and global level? So today we are very honored to have two guests joining me in studio to express their views. Professor Darren S. Munglu from MIT joining us from Boston, and he is the 2005 John Clark Medalist and one of the most well-respected economists in the world. He has formulated economic theories under big political economy contexts with a historic framework through numerous publications. In Beijing, still to join me is Professor Lu Feng, also a renowned economist focusing on institutional changes and, most importantly, how such changes shape a booming economy in China. Professor Lu Feng is from Beijing University's National School of Development. And, gentlemen, I look forward to a candid discussion today. So, Darren, let me start with you. Thank you very much for. Taking time out of your busy schedule, you have expressed a lot of concerns about the U.S. failing to act during the pandemic. And what is the cause of such failure in your mind? Thank you, Kate. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I think, broadly speaking, the U.S. has a number of problems that, especially, culminated at the beginning of the pandemic in. Exhibiting itself as a failure of state capacity, the state failing to play a leadership role. But you know, now that it's been essentially 16 months since the beginning of the pandemic,、right. we can see that almost every country has failed at different stages of this pandemic because it's such a complex、uh, disease. It has an economic aspect, it has a regulation aspect, it has a scientific aspect, it has a trust aspect. And、uh, I don't think any single country.、Uh, I mean, there are a few exceptions that I think、uh, were sort of fortunate,、uh, as well as you know, conducted policy very well, such as、uh, <clears throat> New Zealand, Taiwan, to some extent South Korea, that really did everything, you know, in terms of both social distancing and、uh, later vaccines in a in a transparent way that. You know, develop some sort of communication with their、uh, population, but U.S. certainly failed to do so, and we're seeing how badly European countries are doing at the moment. This just reflects many aspects of the state capacity and state society trust relations that need to be、uh, at the forefront of this, and also good leadership, using science, using expertise, being ahead of the curve. These are very difficult things, and. You know, in some sense, you can think of the pandemic really laying bare a lot of the institutional problems that many countries all over the world had developed over the last several decades. You know, Europe, U.S., Latin America, but also you know East Asia and China included. 
Right, but you know, if you count the United States as an inclusive uh, economic and political institution, shouldn't um, being honest and then try to be able to display its shortcoming and admit itself its failure in front of public with strong leadership as uh, those characters of an inclusive institution? Uh, in an ideal world, yes, but if you think of the U.S., uh, especially in, in the context of the, uh, the, the, the more recent book that James Robinson and I wrote, The Narrow Corridor, right. uh, where we try to not just classify countries into whether they are inclusive and how they have sort of uh, fared in terms of the 20th century, but really understand how they got onto a particular development and political path. You know, U.S. has always been a problematic case. It's inclusive institutions, I think, shouldn't be denied. But on the other hand, they were always undergirded by a Faustian bargain. Uh, uh, you know, at the time the Republic was founded, both because it involved discrimination, overt discrimination against uh, what was then, you know, uh, you know, a, a fifth of the population, the slave uh, black American population, right. and also many deals that made local elites strong, especially in the South, and the state very constrained, state capacity very ham-handed. Mm -hmm. And those have always been a problem for the U.S. It's not a new new issue. You know, it's it's one of the things that have has made American poverty eradication, poverty fighting programs so difficult. But I think even countries with a better track record of inclusivity have stumbled because this was such an unusual, uh, unusual shock. You know, look at Germany. I think uh, Germany, in some sense, has built a more open democracy and has had better communication right. with its people and at the early stages it did very well but it's uh it later especially when it came to the uh to the to the business of acquiring vaccines because of the european union germany relations because of several other things that uh you know uh were ongoing at the time it really slowed down the german efforts as well so it's 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 not something that you can easily say inclusive societies have uh, done are were expected to do better and have done better and look at china i mean i think china has a lot of problems and i think china made a lot of mistakes at the early stages but it was extremely successful in terms of containing the pandemic and eradicating it it's one of the few countries that really eradicated it without vaccination right uh but on the other hand i think the the chinese efforts uh, at the early stages were very problematic because of lack of transparency did not really clamp down on the disease before it could uh, it got worse and that i think is uh, an aspect of a non inclusive more despotic authoritarian country and also i think uh, china could have done better in terms of vaccines and, uh, and and vaccines openness and vaccines transparency which i think is going to be the next stage of this we're going to be with this pandemic for the next two years and vaccines are going to be at the center stage of that Right. Great. Um, although I don't uh, agree with you on, on the two words despotic or authoritarian, um, but, you know, uh, we can comment on that ideological um, parts later. Um, Professor Lu, how would you comment on China's effort and U.S. effort and global effort in terms of combating this COVID? Yes, I share uh, Darren's opinion that uh, this academic, uh, pandemic uh, disease spreading is, uh, is a unique challenge for the human being, right. not only United States, but uh, including China, all the countries. You know, I remember, you know, and about uh, half a century ago, uh, the leading uh, public health experts in the United States and Western Euro Europe believed uh, these uh, infectious diseases were diminishing, you know, mm -hmm. as a result right. of the advancement of the public health, medical. Right. Uh, technology as well as you know vaccine okay but actually now we have this kind of things right. uh, earlier we have other things okay so it's a challenge so I think every country all the countries in the world are learning how to deal with that okay. uh, I, I also agree that China has been and very successful you know and containing 
the disease in this pandemic, especially without the vaccine, you know, right. uh, control, you know, the disease through how can I say management of the mm. social distance, you know. But of course, uh, because the lack of the experiences, right. uh, we could have detected disease and uh, make the decisive well, actions we earlier. Yeah, as well, yeah. right. So I think there's a lot of reasons. I, I think across the world, every country can learn, learn the lessons. But uh, I personally also, I think a lot of people believe and uh, accept China has been, uh, did a very good job in controlling the disease so far especially without, uh, you know, widespread uh, vaccine, mm -hmm. you know. I think China can de deliver that results because a lot of reasons. Uh, simply speaking, number one, I think it demonstrated the tremendous uh, capability of, of, of mobilization right. across the whole country, the society. Number two, I think uh, that also demonstrates uh, the capability of the government of delivering or implementation you know, effectiveness. So especially Chinese government, if they want to do one thing, okay, focus one objective, usually they can do it very effectively, right. very effectively. Number three, I, I think also because Chinese people, uh, 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 relatively speaking, are well disciplined, okay, so they want to uh, sacrifice uh, to some degree of the civil uh, liberty, you know, and to exchange for these, uh, these kind of public health mm. security. I think uh, that is the strength, relative strength of China's society. But I, I, I also agree that, you know, this game is not over yet. Right. So the disease has not been fully controlled, especially the India's the season uh, situation is yeah. very worrisome. So right. I think uh, we still have to learn. Mm. Also join the lessons through the experiences, right. then we can do better in the future. Also, we can share exper experiences and the lessons across different countries. Right, absolutely. Um, during this whole process, in the past one and a half years, execution, uh, people's discipline, um, government coordination, um, and even ordinary citizen sacrifice are very, very important. And, and as what you said, Professor Lu, while Indian's case is coming up, we hope that we can actually learn lesson from it. And as a global uh, community, we can also help them uh, as much as we can. So um, uh, Darren, in one of your most recent publications, you mentioned instead of a bipolar system, system, um, you are stating a quadripolar system. Um, you think that's more assertive with uh, European countries and other emerging economies uh, joining the dynamic. How much different it is from a multilateral world or multilateralism? Uh, it, it is, it is a, a version of multilateralism, but what I meant is effective multilateralism. Right now you can say there is multilateralism, but the developing world except you know, China, of course, is now uh, almost out of the developing world, but it's a force onto itself on the world stage. So leaving China out, I think the developing world is not playing much of a role. European Union is trying to, but only in a few areas it has really established the type of leadership right. that it needs to show. And I am in particular, uh, I was in particular concerned about three areas where we think, where I think we need uh, the effective type of multilateralism, so the quadrupolar polar world being, I think, one way of doing that. Uh, one was climate change. Right. The other one was automation and AI, the future of automation, AI, privacy, what we are going to do with artificial intelligence, with robots, with all of the... Uh, new capabilities that we are acquiring for whose benefit and what for what under what type of constraints we are going to develop them and deploy them and then the third is democracy and i think for all three of these if the world is dominated by the american chinese axis it won't be ideal for climate change it won't be ideal obviously because china and us are the two biggest uh, polluters and uh, despite you know, the uh, really uplifting new commitment from the Biden administration on climate change, I think it's not enough. And uh, Europe has been far ahead in terms of uh, commitment and decarbonization than 
any other part of the world. And the developing world really, you know, has to play a leadership role, and it's in its in, in its inter- interest to play it because, you know, look the 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 main people who will bear the brunt of climate change in the next 30 years, 40 years, are going to be the people who live in India, Bangladesh, Africa, uh, Central America. So, so I think the developing world needs to be uh, part of this and, and should play more of a leadership role. When it comes to AI, I think the situation is even worse. I think the vision of AI that has developed both in the US and in China, though different from each other, I think they're both faulty. In the US, there is too much power in the hands of corporations and excessive zeal towards automation. In China, I think the automation will come as well, but it's very much a limitless ability of the government, often in in conjunction with corporations, as long as they are pliant, to collect data about individuals, so which is disempowering, which really makes individuals less likely to become citizens and active participants in politics. I think it also starts more and more, as we are seeing in the US, distorting the economic model when uh, with so much data, corporations as well as governments can start influencing individual choices too much. And I think, again, here we need more voices. European Union has been ahead of uh, the US certainly and ahead of other places in terms of calling for data privacy and and, and deregulated and regulating uh, big tech. I think that's very important. And also the developing world, I think, has to be at the table here, because when you think of the current current direction of AI technologies going more and more towards automation, that's going to be a big cost for the developing world. You know, if you think of the growth strategy that China deployed or South Korea deployed, which was use, you know, basically your abundant labor, start exporting simple products and then from there go up the value chain that's not going to be it's not going to be possible in the future because you know developing country workers in Indonesia in Malaysia in, in in Myanmar in Vietnam are going to be competing not against american or german workers but are going to be competing against robots numerically controlled machines and algorithms that are getting cheaper and cheaper so the developing world needs to be really at the table as well and i think for the future of democracy again pulling it out of this china us competition i think is very important then of course you know we can put russia in there as well uh russia's effects are you know russia is a declining power uh uh you know, its economic might is nowhere where it was before. Its economic and political influence is nowhere comparable to China, but it's playing a very important role as well. And again, a quadrupolar world would be useful for uh, checking those impulses as well. Right. Fair enough. We're going to touch upon the climate and also the technology automation um, and its impact on the labor market a little bit later. But before that, uh, Professor Lu Feng, let mm-hmm. me ask you, as was described by Darren, um, this is essentially still bipolar because some countries in the EU and some countries in the developing countries will choose to follow either US or choose to follow China. Isn't this still the two, block, two blocks? How should we um, be able to avoid such kind of Cold War mentality um, if, if the world is indeed divided into two big blocks? I think uh, the idea, you know, and uh, in Darren's and, uh, essay is, is very interesting, you know, and the quadrupolar. But to me, I think the immediate question is, uh, is this concept is a positive sort of description of the, what happened uh, right now, or it is the positive sort of idea you want to prefer the world is involved in that direction. Okay, uh, I think if you want to say you want the world to become the, uh, how can I say, and the culture polio, and the Chinese were, uh, were, were rather, I, I uh, on, on based on my personal observation, I think Chinese when don't have a lot of difficulty to accept that. Maybe Japanese were not happy about <laughs> that because you not say that is one of the polar. Actually, right. in China, I'm not expert in the international relationships. We always say it's a one hegemony, that is the United States, right. but multipolar. Okay, so uh, your uh, preference, if uh, presumably you are, you use that as a normative concept is in line with that of uh, a lot of the uh, 
uh, concept of the multipolar. Okay, but I agree. You know, maybe two polar will have sort of in inherent instability. Okay, there were some problems because uh, you always want to be overwhelmed over uh, another side. But uh, in reality, whether you can have the polar or multipolar, it, it is a, it is an interesting question, but uh, we have a lot of difficulties because when you say number one, when you say you know the fourth caller as sort of emerging country, separate emerging country, Who's going to take they the can you know work together as one country, but uh, this kind of allies, we we all know that uh, non allies uh, movement seventy three. 77 countries you know, emerged in history. They're always a player. Right. Also, right now, we have these so-called BRICS, okay, BRICS countries. Okay. So different allies, different configuration of different countries, they'll always be there. But I'm not sure whether this kind of the combination portfolio will have the exactly or even similar role as a single country like States right. or like a European. Uh, country okay that that is an interesting concept, but uh, I think uh, uh, they can how can I say uh, uh, give a, a lot of reflection on that uh, i of course, I agree with you I fully agree that we should avoid the mentality of the cold war, as you mentioned actually i think even even though china and u s relationships has a lot of difficulties. I think uh, that is uh, more or less is uh, mainstream opinion, right. both in states as well as in this country. We should avoid uh, sort of the Cold War. I personally think now we have a lot of problems in the context of the bilateral relationships between states and China. But I think uh, the difficulties or sort of the tension is quite different from the Cold War. Right. Okay. Number one, of course, I think the most important thing is China had a dramatic development over the last four decades. But one of the basic sort of driving force is opening up. So China is one of the maybe very quite unique uh, can, uh, case that it managed to develop very quickly through globalization, through opening up. Right. Okay. Number two, because of opening up, China actually re- Remodified the traditional hardline, you know, this kind of Soviet Union ideology. Right. So, in other words, uh, maybe there's a debate, but I think uh, China. I believe China don't want to challenge the existing sort of regime, you know, uh, created by uh, dominated by the United States. That's totally different from Soviet Union because Soviet Union worked away in. Building up the Bretton Woods system. Actually, uh, when you read the biology of you know and, uh, Harry uh, Dexon, Dexon, he went to Soviet Union, joined IMF, right. okay, and also what but uh, what uh, trade organization. Yes. But Soviet Union Stalin decided it's not in the interests of the Soviet Union, so he refused to do that. Right. China is totally different. Finally, I think also very important. Because the historical experiences of the Cold War, mm-hmm. so nobody wants to repeat that, right. especially China. I think because of the, all, all these reasons, I think uh, you know uh, we should avoid. Also, I I don't think we will go to the same road of the uh, Cold War. Right. But we still have a lot of problems. I think a solution is two. Number one. United States as well as developed countries should accept China's modernization as a future trend. Right. Number two, China should further opening up as well as reform her own regime for the sake of China's own interest, but also can help reconciliate of the relationship with the rest of the world. Right. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's fair enough. So, Darren, do you think a Cold War mentality is avoidable or you think we're already in the Cold War trap? Well, you know, in some sense, yes, we have a Cold War mentality because I think many people, both in China and in the Can't U.S., are sure. thinking in terms of a bipolar world with two poles opposed to each other. But, yes, I completely agree with, uh, with, with Professor Liu. Uh, 
this is a very different situation. In some ways, much more hopeful and positive than the Cold War, right. but also with its own dangers. Right. And those dangers may be uh, accentuated because we have so much closer relations between China and the U.S. Right. First of all, absolutely, China's rise, you know, nobody can take credit for such a spectacular increase in living standards just by itself or by himself or by herself. But globalization is a very, very important component. I don't think China could have grown anywhere close to what it did if it remained a closed economy uh, over the last four decades. And that, so we, we, we have to applaud globalization that has brought such better living standards to, you know, hundreds of millions of people in China. More than a billion people probably benefited from it. Uh, China has now the world's largest middle class thanks to globalization. But we also have to recognize that there isn't just one model of globalization. And the model of globalization that emerged was not very good for many workers and low education workers in the US and in Europe. Right. Uh, it was a globalization that was very capital friendly, very large firm friendly. It is the, this particular type of globalization that has enabled uh, American companies, to some degree European companies as well, but even more American companies to uh, avoid taxes to a huge extent. Even worse for the workers to uh, offshore production in a way that arbitrages, uh, labor relations, human rights, uh, uh, safety issues, you know, uh, that undercut both the power and the economic livelihood of workers in the U.S. And uh, and I think it's great that China specialized in a number of uh, products and exported them. I think that was that is that that is something the world can. Uh, will, will and has benefited from in some respects, but right. the way in which China was incorporated into the world trade organizations at a very high speed and, you know, imports from China exploded in the U.S. was very costly as well. Uh, you know, work by my co-author and friend, colleague David Otter and his collaborators, as well as work that I did with David Otter and others, uh, estimates that you know, uh, more than a million, as many as two million jobs were lost in the U.S. Uh, as a result of cheaper Chinese products coming in and destroying certain uh, light, uh, light, low, low value added manufacturing, such as apparel, textile, uh, uh, toys, etc. Now, I think that could have been managed better. This is not a call for you know, closing down borders, but, you know, I think uh, huge transitions, whatever they are, you know, can be handled better once you understand what they are doing, perhaps slow it down a little so that not all of these jobs are lost at once. You know, the U.S. labor market is has an amazing dynamism, if you look at it. It reallocates tens of millions of people every year. From the job, from one type of job to another type of job, but even such a dynamic labor market, if you have a local economy, say you know Pittsburgh, where they specialize in in everything that suddenly becomes you know 50 percent or 30 percent cheaper, you know that whole local economy collapses. So there are aspects of this globalization that was very much you know pro capital and was beneficial for China as well, and and I think we have to think about that. But overall. I, I, I think this is what also Professor Liu was uh, hinting at. I don't think it would be good for the world to pull back from globalization, but it is also inevitable. There is a, there is a move towards deglobalization. I don't think it's going to take us back to where we were in the 1970s, but it's a time for us to rethink what aspects of globalization that we want, how we can, mm -hmm. for example, make it such that workers in China, workers in the US also benefit as much from it. And right. then there's another question here, which I want to just touch upon before I conclude, which is that, you know, I think globalization at the end is our best guarantor when it comes to US-China relations. You know, Soviet Union and the US could have pursued 
completely adversarial, almost warlike conditions for three decades because they were not trading. They had very little exchange of ideas, exchange right. of goods, exchange of capital. That's not the situation with China. And I think that is something that's very beneficial. On the other hand, the warning is that if relations become really bad, despite this globalization, the costs of it will be very high as well. So the stakes are higher. We have good shock absorbers for US-China relations, but if we don't manage them, which will be a mistake of the leaders, then uh, the, the costs would be astronomical as well. Right. Fair enough. I think you mentioned a very important um, um, a word, which is the labor market. Uh, the labor market in the U.S. and labor market in China. Um, I want to touch upon the labor market a little bit more, but on the context, under the context of um, technology and also automation. You're saying that globalization actually caused um, some industries and, 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 and some job markets um, lost their uh, positions because of the influx from, um, from outside or because of the uh, structural change in the economies. Um, however, automation is probably a much stronger force. It's, it, it, it is coming out of the preparation of every ordinary people. How do you think it will impact the labor market in the US? Um, and, and very importantly, as you just mentioned, China has a huge manufacturing base, um, as well as other developing countries. What will be the repercussion? Uh, Great question. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, you, you wanted to no, ask me first? So, or yes, professor? please, Darren, just go ahead. I'll yeah. get, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you, look, I think those are central questions, and thanks for raising them. And, and, and I completely agree with you. I think if you look at the overall picture in the U.S. over the last 30 years, automation has been more important than trade with China. So there's no doubt about that. So right. if today, the U.S. labor market, or in my mind, there's no doubt. There are people who have different views, but in my mind, there's no doubt about that. Uh, there, uh, you know, economic opportunities for workers without a college degree in the U.S. have completely collapsed. The American dream, you know, the American dream isn't like for people who have a PhD from Stanford to become a billionaire, sure. That's part of what we see. But really the American dream is, you know, you grow up in a rural town uh, with your parents uh, barely able to read, and then you get a middle class job and have a house and have a car, you can send your children to college. You know, that's the American dream. And that was enabled by factory jobs that paid really good wages for workers without a college degree. It was enabled by clerical jobs that paid really attractive wages that built careers. And those have disappeared. And again, uh, the influx of imports for some local labor markets has been devastating, but mostly this is because of automation. And is that, does that mean automation is, is, is a force for bad? No. If you look at history, automation has been at the center of many technological and industrial transformations. It's been one of the forces that has increased, that, 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 that has increased productivity greatly. But in the past, automation was counterbalanced by other technologies that made workers more productive as well. And that has ceased. And that's why when we were talking about the quadrupolar world and I was talking about the future of AI, I'm really worried about AI because AI as a broad technological platform can be used for so many things. It can be used for empowering governments to survey uh, and monitor individuals. It can be uh, used for empowering individuals to become better citizens, more informed, more active, politically participant people that are able to protect their own data and use their own data in the way that they want. It can be used for creating lots of new tasks and new capabilities for workers, or it can be used for automating them. And, and, and typically we are going, the, we're taking the low road right now everywhere around the world. And that is why I think the labor market is looking worse and worse for workers with non-college degree, uh, without a college degree in the US. And that's why we need to counterbalance automation. We need to find incentives for companies to create and deploy technologies in a way that is more useful for, for workers. And this is not just a US problem. We see that in Europe, but more importantly, it's a developing world problem as well, as I mentioned because before, because you know the developing world, its advantage is its large labor force. 
So if we make that labor force less and less useful for production, less and less central in the production process, that's bad. You know, China is in an intermediate situation, as you pointed out. It is the manufacturing center of the globe. Uh, but China is also aging and it's at the forefront of automation right now. But there is a hope that in my mind, at least on the automation front, China may be made more successful than the US because you know, it still has a huge labor force and it should use that labor force. And perhaps that's going to encourage you know, the Chinese system to find technological applications for that labor force as well as automating them so the two can go hand in hand. On the other hand, of course, there are other aspects of AI, such as the balance between government power and civil society, there I think China is uh, making the worst choices, uh, and but the U.S. is also making really bad choices. Right. Great. Uh, Professor Liu, um, what's your take on that? Do you think China will actually be hit by this? Uh, uh, I think AI is sort of trend of technology and right. the progress. It's inevitable. Actually, if you look at the data, you will see very clearly uh, in recent years, actually, the industrial robots used in China has been increasing very rapidly. I did some investigation on that issue. Uh, that is inevitable. But uh, you also, we also worry that uh, you know maybe uh, that will be conflict with the uh, job uh, sort of the creation, you know, uh, creating sort of the employment problems. Right. Actually, last year G20 have the you know the main topic is the opportunities access for all. That also highlights on that issue. But I think on China, this sort of tension is still manageable. Right. I think because that sort of the constraints in this relationships in that, you know, uh, these optimization or industrial robots, they can only be used if you know the wage rate has been growing very rapidly or right. to some certain kind of the critical levels otherwise you know it, it's not economically viable to right. use that kind of things so in that was that sort of the relationships you know link these two things together on the other hand if you using more sort of the ar technology you know like the industrial robots that means the capital you know in the total production systems has been increased their weight. Right. Then as mentioned by Professor uh, Asimogulo, you know, the productivity will increase. So it also may increase the wage rate. Right. But of course it will depress the growth rates of the wage in the sectors that this AR technology has been used. Right. So in other words in China these kind of the driving force were uh, push forward the, 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 the growth in that direction in which, you know, the other sectors were increasing job creation. Right. So these sectors, you know, will not be substituted by the AR technology right. and uh, sort of optimization uh, technology. So then we will see quite, quite dynamic you know, quite uh, sort of compli complicated process ahead. So, of course, I agree with uh, Professor Asamagolo. Maybe United States as a frontier country, they've, uh, they have, you know, and more pressures on that side because this optimization trend uh, coupled with globalization offshore, you know, of the jobs to other countries that may be made the lower ends of the laborers, you know, jobs, you know, and the growth rates of the wages and very sluggish right. in recent decades. Well, the reality is, um, if I remember correctly, the real wage um, number in the United States has really been growing, uh, especially in the mid-level workers uh, and the bottom-level workers for, 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 for several decades, am I right? Yes, absolutely. I think that's one of the symptoms of the problems that we're talking about. If you look at median wages, right. they have grown very little. And even the wages of, say, college graduate workers, workers who have a college degree but no postgraduate degree, men with college degree in the U.S. have not increased all that much over the last 30 years. So, and in fact, this is, you know, exactly like Professor Lu said, uh, you know, when you automate jobs, that can be good for labor indirectly because it generates productivity yeah. enough 
demand coming from productivity gains. Mm -hmm. But that really requires very large productivity gains from automation. Right. And everywhere around the world, as you know, there has been a productivity slowdown, despite the fact that we are going through one of the most creative periods of the world economy <laughs> in terms of lots of new widgets, lots of patents, lots of new algorithms. You know, productivity is not growing. And a, and, a, and a result of all of this has been really a, 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 a terrible labor market for workers, uh, for, for most workers. You know, the, the groups that have benefited in the U.S. are workers with postgraduate degrees and women with college degree and postgraduate degree, but all the other groups are not doing very well. Right. Um, well, I think uh, this is probably something that we will need to um, a, a, a lot. You know, I wish I had we had longer time to, to discuss because it's a very important question. Let's keep on um, the tech front. So, um, Darren, you know, um, I don't know if you have any contact with the tech companies in China or not. Uh, but you know, the tech monopoly or antitrust um, action is on, undergoing in China right now as well. Um, you see that uh, the government is starting to uh, fine those big uh, conglomerates for the uh, antitrust behavior, partially just to uh, protect the benefits of the consumers and also. So uh, in your way to make the tech growth more inclusive. Um, so I don't know how um, you will comment on the antitrust activity globally in the tech sector um, to better protect consumers' benefit as well as to make sure the growth will be inclusive. And uh, uh, the most importantly, that the advance in the technology uh, development will not further create any inequality. Very good questions, Kate. Uh, and look, uh, I think we need to rein in the tech sector. So I agree with that. But I'll put two caveats. First of all, my view has always been that antitrust is not an important issue. The reason why I worry about the tech sector is not because they are going to charge suddenly big markups. You know, they will do that and when at some point. And, but until now, you can't say, you know, Google or Amazon or Facebook are, you know, charging huge markups. That's not the problem. The problem to me is the effects of these companies on the direction of technological change and on consumer autonomy and power. So most importantly, these companies have transformed the direction of technological change towards more and more automation, more and more things that empower companies at the expense of workers and at the expense of government. And the fact that we are not getting enough productivity growth, especially we're not generating enough opportunities for workers without a college degree, for example, I think is intimately linked to the dominance of a few very large companies in the US. And I'm also very worried about the extent to which companies like Facebook, Google, Netflix, Amazon have huge amounts of data and can start and have started using these data in various ways that are not good for consumers. So in that sense, I think regulation is, is critical. And you hinted at this, Kate. Regulation has to be global. These com companies are global. And so in that sense, for this debate to have started in China, I think it's fantastic. On the other hand, I worry that in China, the problem is a different one, which is that, you know, the Chinese government is too strong and civil society is too weak. And, you know, the Chinese government making, say, Alibaba more subservient might actually take us towards a more unbalanced situation in that respect. So it could be good in terms of the same type of regulatory priorities that I outlined for the West. But on the other hand, if it means that really the government becomes completely in control of everything and completely in control of all the data, uh, that, that would actually be ultimately bad as well. Right, fair enough. I don't think Chinese government has any intention to, um, or it is actually impossible to control um, all the data, but fair enough, I think that's a very fair point. Um, Professor Lu, please it's give us fair. your comment. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, observation. I think uh, Professor Asamakulu emphasized the necessity of the antitrust sort of the regulation on some extra, you know, observation or the argument, but on the other hand, 
he has some sort of conservation, you know, about China's the policy shift in this regard recently. It's very interesting. To me, I think, uh, sure, the policy in this regard in China has been uh, changed quite rapidly in recent uh, sort of the periods. Uh, I think uh, a lot of accidental reasons, but the overall trend is very important. Uh, In the past, because China always want to, you know, and encourage sort of technological innovation. So the traditional policy they also have two elements. One is inclusive, another is regulation. It's sure. so-called inclusive regulation. Okay, so in other words, inclusive has been given sort of the priority. So it's understandable. Actually, that highlights Chinese policy, industrial policy in this regard is very favorable to this kind of innovation in the early periods. Uh, on the other hand, we, I, I, as, a, as, as a personal observer, I also see actually these high-tech companies also delivered a lot of the services are very efficient, you know, to the ordinary people. Okay, for the industry as well as the firms. For example, the the payment system, you know, right. e- electronic payment system, actually is has been pioneered by the private companies like the Tenshin, Alibaba. Okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, we also see, on the other hand, as the market power become bigger and bigger, you know, and there's some kind of the worries about, uh, you know, monopoly, you know, these kind of things can not detrimental to the potential technology progress and uh, social well-being. So overall speaking, I don't have sort of the uh, very extreme conclusion. I think that that's sort of the balance we must strike. You know, on the one hand, we still allow the firms to innovate, you know, to provide the services, efficient services and the products for the ordinary people using, you know, cutting edge technology. That is very, very good for the overall uh, economy in the China, you know, especially catching up uh, for the whole country. But on the other hand, you know, we must also aware when the country, when the firm become bigger and bigger, the market power can be transformed, you know, transited into some kind of the uh, unjustified the sort of influence. The society right. as a whole must aware that to, right. to give some kind of the regulation. No, I think it's sort of the trial. We see a lot of changes, but generally speaking, I think the government still take a rather precautious approach, you know, want to have the balanced or sustainable sort of the situation. Right, um, fair enough. So. Um in our early discussions, we also, apart from technology, the other very important part we mentioned is um, is climate. But I think you know there are plenty has been discussed on climate before, and I think you know to me that is probably one of the easiest um, area that China and the states can probably uh, work together and cooperate because it's we have the common goal and this is the battle that the human race needs to uh, focus on. Um, we, we have limited time but one important question I still want to discuss with two professors is the social mobility um, because I think uh, to me I think that's very important and also to echo what you two just mentioned um, if there's no social mobility probably the inequality inequality will be further exacerbated. Mm. Um, how to make sure that we have enough social mobility in this um, fast developing uh, technology driven world um, to make sure that there are equal opportunities for everyone. Well, China has already eradicated poverty, extreme poverty already. The uh, U.S., um, despite the globalization process, um, is having inequality um, or even bigger inequality post-COVID. So um, w- what are we observing here, uh, Professor Lu, please? Sure, I fully agree that uh, this social mobility is very important you know, for, 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 for a country or a economy to grow sustainably. I, that, uh, that concept in my personal reading also in, in consistent with the idea of inclusiveness highlighted by Professor uh, Asimaguru and uh, his co-author's book of the Why Nation Fail. Okay, so highlights this concept. I think very important. I think in China, overall speaking, I don't have the chance to have the in-depth study on that area. But as a casual observation, you can see very clearly why China has been 
uh, managed to achieve the remarkable growth over the last four decades because you know we reformed the system, the traditional dual uh, system, which separated uh, you know the, the rural area and the urban area. So make the social uh, mobility has been growing dramatically and right. very tremendously. I think that has been served as one driving forces for, 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 for the economic uh, miracle uh, observed in China. But on the other hand, when China grows and uh, to higher stages, I, maybe we also have the similar problems. For example, we still have the household registration right. system in place. I think that is all maybe not favorable for the enhancing of the uh, desired, uh, you know, more uh, social, social more, mobility. More mobility. I think, uh, overall speaking, we have done a lot of right things in that area, but we still have a lot of the new assignments in right. in future. What do you observe uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, Darren? Please. Well, thank you. So, since we're running out of time, let me also say one sentence on climate change because I agree sure, very please. much with you, Kate. Uh, you know, I think that's a nexus along which China and U.S. can cooperate, and I think their cooperation is really important for the world. But I think it's not enough. I think what's being done is not enough. Uh, I think both China and the U.S. need to do more. So, but 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 I, I completely agree with the sentiment. In terms of social mobility, yes, absolutely. I think social mobility is an important part of inclusivity, and I think it's, a, it's something that both China and the US are going to have problems with, but just like Professor Liu, I have not seen you know, detailed studies on social mobility in, in, in China. I know more about the US. But let me also say that there is a sort of a common sort of ideological theme emerging in China and the US that is sort of centered on meritocracy. Right. You know, somehow if the smart people do well, sort of as somehow uh, associated with an acceptable degree of social mobility that's good. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I don't know that that's enough. You know, look in the U.S., the danger is that we are moving more and more towards a two-tier society where there are people with some very specialized skills, programming, uh, surgeon, uh, top entertainer, lawyer, CEO, they're going to do great. They've been doing great. And the rest of society has low status, does not earn much. The labor market is not, is not what it used to be for them. They are often going to be dependent on government transfers. They are going to be increasingly alienated from both the labor market and social life. And I think that is the new modern version of the extractive institutions that James Robinson and I have painted. You know, in the past, extractive institutions were associated with an all-powerful despotic uh, emperor or general, you know, using his iron fist. Well, in the future, perhaps we don't have the iron fist, we don't have the dictator, but we're still going to have a very dystopic, dystopian society if we have this sort of two-tiered structure. Right. And that, to me, would apply even if there is some degree of social mobility, that perhaps it's okay, perhaps some people who parents were not very well skilled and were very poor might become a great programmer. I think that's better than not, but it's not enough. So I think, uh, and, 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 and I, I see the sort of this meritocracy is a cure for everything uh, view, sort of being very active both in the US and China. And I think it's, it's not enough. So we need social mobility, and but we need more more than that. So we need to deal with inequalities. And and the truth of the matter is that China and U.S. are both doing really badly in terms of inequality. Inequality has increased in both countries. Uh, U.S. is not doing great in terms of social mobility. I don't know what's going on with China, but I see, for example, you know, rich parents being able to send their kids to the best schools in China is becoming a very uh, common practice as well, which was one of the channels via which social mobility has somewhat decreased in the U.S. Uh, you know, and, and social mobility in the U.S. is really a uh, itself a very complex thing. If you look at, you know, somebody who grows up in New York and who is not African-American, their social mobility isn't terrible. It's actually comparable to what's in Europe. Uh, but if you look at African-Americans, or people in the South, they have much lower rates of social mobility. Again, sort of uh, 
highlighting some of the complex nature, uh, some of the complex features of the American economic and political system. So, so I think those are really important challenges that we have to deal with. And coming back to the same themes that we started from, to make the future of social mobility better, we need technologies that are enabling for people with all sorts of skills to earn a decent living, to realize their potential. And we also need democratic institutions. There is no alternative to a sort of democratic system in which people who are at the bottom of the inequality hierarchy have a voice as well. Without that, I think it becomes even worse uh, in terms of heading towards a two-tier system. And, and of course, the problem is that democracy is retreating everywhere. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's getting weaker and weaker. And that was a trend that had started before the pandemic, but the pandemic hasn't helped. Great, thank you. I wish uh, we had more time. Um, you know, we might have different views on ideology and explanations on how institutions are shaping economic development from two different parts of the world. But one goal, I think it's very clear according to today's discussion, we are striving for a better society. Each country will have their own ways to achieve prosperity in the long run and we probably should learn to work with each other. So let the debate continue among academia and let us wish for a much more prosperous world ahead. Thank you very much, Darren. And thank you, Professor Liu. Thank you. Until